Day to moves by the Democrats to impeach him. A whistleblower in the US intelligence service has accused Mr. Trump of putting pressure on the Ukrainian government during a phone call to investigate his Democratic rival Joe Biden, whose son was involved with a business there. Mr. Trump has accused the Democrats of fabricating a version of his conversation with the Ukrainian president. While in his latest tweet, the president said, if that perfect phone call with the president of Ukraine isn't considered appropriate, then no future. to moves by the Democrats to impeach him. A whistleblower in the US intelligence service has accused Mr. Trump of putting pressure on the Ukrainian government during a phone call to investigate his Democratic rival Joe Biden, whose son was involved with a business there. Mr. Trump has accused the Democrats of fabricating a version of his conversation with the Ukrainian president. While in his latest tweet, the president said, if that perfect phone call with the president of Ukraine isn't considered appropriate, then no future president can ever again speak to another foreign leader. However, the Intelligence Community's Inspector General has described the whistleblower's complaint as credible. The Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, has been speaking earlier to the talk show Morning Joe about what happens next. I think that we should move uh, with purpose and expeditiously, not hastily, though. And the matter is in the hands of the Intelligence Committee under leadership of Adam Schiff, of whom, of whom we're very, very proud, and, and our members of the committee. I know you had Sean Patrick Maloney on earlier. We're very proud of him. And, and so they will take the time that they need. Mm -hmm. uh, and we won't have the calendar be the arbiter, but we do there's a, it doesn't have to drag on and again we're in court and on many of these cases whether it's the president's taxes his bank accounts his uh, uh, um, accounting uh, emoluments a whole slew of other things I think this probably will be done before the courts was, who knows the timing of the courts uh, but again it's it's no use to just say by such and such a date but looking at the, uh, shall we say, the material mm -hmm. that the administration is giving us, they are actually speeding up the process. Nancy Pelosi there. So what are the accusations against President Trump? Well, the whistleblower says the Trump administration ran a months-long campaign to get Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden and his son. That campaign culminated in a phone call on July the 25th when Donald Trump himself repeatedly asked the Ukrainian president to investigate the Bidens. The whistleblower then says White House aides were so concerned about what was discussed in the call they put records of the conversation into lockdown and moved the official word-for-word -word transcript to a classified server. After the letter outlining the President Trump, just bring us up to date on kind of where we're at now. Uh, well, uh, the members of the House of Representatives are, are scheduled to go on a two-week, uh, not vacation, but district work period where they'll go back to, uh, to their home districts. But the House Intelligence Committee, the one that Nancy Pelosi spoke of uh, in that interview we just heard, are going to stay here in town and begin uh, their I impeachment inquiry with a focus on this Ukraine story. And there's word that even by the end of next week, they could start issuing subpoenas and calling witnesses. So uh, while Nancy Pelosi was reluctant to give a timeline uh, for this inquiry, it seems like they want to move reasonably quickly to start gathering information. Uh, remember, this was, would be the first part of a process to try to remove Donald Trump, a vote in the House of Representatives on impeachment that would then... Uh, the Mueller inquiry. Does this have a different feel, though, now, a different urgency to what we've heard in the past? when actually there wasn't an overwhelming amount of support from Democrats previously. People have gotten on board on an impeachment inquiry. Is this, this is happening quickly. It also uh, is dealing with an issue that is looking ahead to the 2020 elections. Now, this was something about Donald Trump allegedly using the powers of his presidency to pressure a foreign government to give him information that would be damaging uh, against Joe Biden, a, a possible candidate against him for the 2020 election. While the Mueller stuff the emoluments, the business dealings, all that was kind of backwards looking. So there were a lot of new Democrats who got elected in 2018. Uh, they feel like this happened on their watch and that's why they feel like they have to take action. So Anthony, how is this all playing out uh, away from Washington amongst the American public? 
Well, we've had a handful of polls come out already since the story first broke last last week and it does show impeachment it seems like the partisan battle lines are forming now democrats who maybe uh, previously were a little bit on the fence about whether this was a good idea or everyone should focus on just beating donald trump at the ballot box uh, in november 2020 they're now kind of coming home and that says something about uh, how the leadership in the house of representatives the democrats are consolidating around this strategy uh, and democrats by and large are starting to fall into line Okay, Anthony, thanks very much for joining us. Well, let's see how it's playing out amongst the Republicans. I'm joined now by Rachel Frazin, reporter for The Hill. Rachel, good to see you. Thanks very much for being with us here on BBC World News, live from Washington. So let's talk about that. We've seen members of the Trump team and the uh, GOP saying that they've seen a massive boost in fundraising since talk of the a possible impeachment has really been doing the rounds over the past few days. What's going on? Uh, yes, the Trump campaign is saying that combined with the Republican National Committee, they have raised uh, $13 million since the inquiry. So this is really quite a bonanza for them. They're really uh, rallying their supporters to give money to the campaign. So this is something that's really helping them with fundraising. I don't know if it'll help them politically, but at least on the fundraising side, this has really been a rallying cry for them, for their supporters. Yeah, let's have a look at a couple of tweets about this. And um, we've heard from Brad Pascal, Trump 2020 campaign manager tweeted, yesterday on Thursday. In the 24 hours since news of Nancy Pelosi's impeachment announcement at Real Donald Trump's campaign and at GOP have blown out fundraising. Five million dollars combined in 24 hours. Donors in all 50 states. Huge groundswell of support leading to Trump landslide in 2020. What do you make of this? We've got one from Eric Trump as well saying a big thank you to at Speaker Pelosi and the Democrats in the last 48 hours. We've raised 8.5 million dollars. Is this massively backfiring for the Democrats, do you think? Well, it depends, you know, on what their objective is here. Um, fundraising wise, uh, perhaps it is giving the Trump campaign at least the dollars. I couldn't tell you about the support. That's another matter. Um, so it's hard to say right now whether this will actually help them down the line. But at least in terms of fundraising, um, it, this is uh, giving the, fun the Trump campaign. And some fundraising. That being said, you are seeing on the Democratic side. Well, it's hard to quantify those numbers exactly because it's not as centralized. On the Republican side, you have um, almost all of the efforts focused on Trump, even though he does have a few challengers. But the RNC is really all in for Trump, it seems. Um, whereas on the Democratic side, since there are so many candidates, it's hard to say, um, you know, how much money they're raising. But they're at least pushing this. So I imagine there's some method to that. I mean, Donald Trump is extremely defiant, as you would expect, of course. What kind of messaging are the Trump campaign and GOP using around the notion and possibility of impeachment? Uh, they're just sort of talking about it like it's something that needs to be stopped, and they are using it as a rallying cry. They're saying to people in fundraising email, uh, go and support him, and they're saying, you know, you have to show that you're one of his most loyal supporters and giving to him in his time of need while they are attacking him. This has sort of been going into their, uh, in, or into Trump's ongoing um, rhetoric that this is a witch hunt or that they are going after him or that the Dems are out to get him. Okay, so Rachel. this really does play into that narrative. Rachel Frazen, reporter for The Hill. Thanks very much for joining us from Washington. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, if you are confused, and I wouldn't blame if you are, by the latest White House scandal or just want to know more, have a look online. BBC.com slash news has all the details about what President Trump is alleged to have said to his Ukrainian counterpart and what the reaction has been. Here in the UK, a former cabinet minister, Amber Rudd, has accused the prime minister's office of using aggressive language that incites violence. It comes after a turbulent week as the House of Commons was recalled, with several MPs criticising the prime minister's use of words. Boris Johnson has insisted that delivering Brexit on the 31st of October would bring much of the heat out of the debate. Here's our political correspondent, Alex Forsyth. It might seem calm today, but it's been a fractious week in Westminster. With heated scenes in the House of Commons came claims that words like surrender, when used about Brexit, are divisive, even dangerous. Now Amber Rudd, a former Home Secretary who only quit the government a few weeks ago, has waded in, this language. telling the Evening Standard newspaper... 
the sort of language we've seen more and more coming out from Number 10 does incite violence. Hello. Uh, An extraordinary accusation aimed at the Prime Minister. Today, during a hospital visit, he said any threat against MPs was appalling, but insisted he was not stoking division. What we need to, to do now is to get Brexit done by October the 31st, and I genuinely think that uh, once you do that, then so much of the of the heat and the anxiety will come out of the debate. I think a lot of people are very tense. I think businesses are, are still uncertain, and. Get it done, I think we'll all be able uh, to move on. ...line of October the 31st, despite the fact Parliament's passed a law saying he'll have to delay if he doesn't get a Brexit deal. With such little trust here, opposition parties are talking tactics. The SNP leader today suggested ousting the Prime Minister and didn't rule out the Labour leader as a temporary replacement. I don't uh, particularly want to push Jeremy Corbyn here. The point I'm making is that if the opposition is to unite behind a clear plan that takes away the threat of a no deal and moves to a general election where I think everybody now accepts is where we should be heading, then we're all going to have to compromise. But plenty here won't put the Labour leader in charge, even if only for a short time to slow the Brexit process. So we need to have a solution that will work um, now. Jeremy Corbyn doesn't have the numbers, uh, the basic parliamentary arithmetic isn't there and to be fair, he knows that, the SNP know that, you and I know that. So a direct move against number 10 isn't expected imminently, but with feelings here still running high, don't expect an outbreak of calm either. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Westminster. Well, let's take a look at some of the other stories making the news. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has warned of a bloodbath when India lifts its curfew in Indian-administered Kashmir. In a fiery speech to the United Nations General Assembly, Mr Khan pointed to the presence of a 900,000-strong Indian force in the disputed territory, which has been under lockdown for 53 days after India revoked the Muslim-majority state's special status. The British flag tanker detained by Iran's Revolutionary Guards in July has reached international waters on route to Dubai. That's according to its owners. The Stena Impero was detained in the Strait of Hormuz in July. That seizure came after British forces intercepted an Iranian tanker off Gibraltar on suspicion of carrying oil to Syria. And that ship was released in August. Police in Nigeria have freed some 500 people, many of them young children, from a building where they've been allegedly chained, tortured and sexually abused. The victims told police they had been taken to the facility in the northern Kaduna state by their relatives for religious education, only to be locked up. Police say some captives were as young as five years old. Captives in chains, boys, teenagers and grown men held in a so-called Islamic school and unable to leave. Look at, they put chains on me with all the level of my exposure. One look at my own age, I have responsibilities on my head, but they denied me access to a lot of things. Police received a tip-off from relatives of children held here that suggested this place was not what it seemed. Beg, they said, no, no, we can't see these children until three months. I said, okay, take this loaf of bread and take it to them. So when we go back home now, we had a family meeting, so we say, okay, the only thing now we should uh, report this issue to the police station. Exactly that is what we do. The police said this was no educational institution. We discovered that we have small, small children, under five, graduates, even civil servants are here. Most of them are chain. Chain, as far as I'm concerned, this is not a rehab. Rather, it's a modern day slavery. Millions of students are in Islamic schools across northern Nigeria. Parents in this deprived region often have to leave their children in religious boarding schools. These institutions have been dogged with allegations of abuse. Earlier this year, the government said it planned to ban them, but wouldn't say when. As the victims are treated and reunited with their families, this latest incident may be a reminder of the need for reform. Maini Jones, BBC News, Lagos. 
A huge crackdown by Egypt's security forces has prevented mass protests from taking place in the capital Cairo. There were online calls for demonstrations against alleged corruption by President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and the military. Instead, it was the leader's supporters who staged rallies in his defence. Protests broke out last week and since then, human rights groups say nearly 2,000 people have been arrested. Salik Nabil is our correspondent in Cairo. It has been a quiet day in Cairo so far, although there were calls for huge anti-government protests. But it seems that the people are too scared to take to the streets, like they did briefly last week. Security presence has been beefed up all around the city. Cars are not allowed into Tahrir Square, only pedestrians. We've seen security personnel stopping passers-by, checking their mobile phones and looking for their ID cards. Only small-scale protests have taken place in a couple of cities in the south of the country and in one neighborhood in Cairo. On the other hand, thousands have taken part in pro-CC gatherings in eastern Cairo. The president himself has downplayed the significance of the protests that called on him to step down, making it clear Egypt is strong and there is nothing to worry about. It's a nervous time and many are waiting to see what will happen in the coming hours. Salina Bill in Cairo there. The Duke of Sussex has walked through a partially cleared minefield in Angola to highlight the threat posed by landmines, 22 years after his mother Diana, Princess of Wales, did the same. Prince Harry wore body armour as he walked through the ex-artillery base near the southeastern town of Dirico. Our royal correspondent Nick Witchell has been following the Prince's tour of Africa. Minefields, a massive problem in Angola and an issue with a particular resonance for Harry in memory of his mum combing the ground metre by metre. He detonated a mine which had been found a few days ago. And then on to Huambo, Angola's second city. It was here 22 years ago that Diana, Princess of Wales, was filmed walking along a safe corridor through a minefield. It brought the whole issue to the world's attention and led eventually to an international ban. Today the spot, which had once been a minefield, is an anonymous street, but a place for a proud son to visit and to reflect on what his mother achieved. To walk in her footsteps is, is clearly quite emotional for me, um, but I think as much as, she, as much as she did then, there is still so much to do. But without question, if she hadn't have campaigned the way that she did 22 years ago, this, would, this could arguably still be a minefield. Um, so I'm, I'm incredibly proud of what she's, what she's been able to do. Fully 17 years after the end of Angola's civil war, people are still suffering life-changing injuries. Harry visited and officially named the Princess Diana Orthopaedic Centre, where the victims of landmines are treated and fitted with prosthetic limbs. 22 years after Diana died, and there are still more than a thousand minefields here in Angola, Harry's message expressed today, let's finish the job. Nicholas Mitchell, BBC News, Coambo. The World Athletics Championships are underway in Qatar after a build-up dominated by debates over fierce heat, low ticket sales and doping allegations. The host city, Doha, is using what's been described as jaw-dropping air conditioning technology inside stadiums to reduce the 40-degree heat outside to safe levels. Adi Adadoyan is our reporter in Doha. It is very, very warm in here. That air condition system that you're talking about inside the stadium does really work. I've walked trackside and it, the temperature is about 22, 23 degrees. So it's good. Marathon, which is going to take place at midnight. They're staging it at midnight because of the extreme heat and because of the extreme conditions. And there have been a lot of concerns because if you remember back at the Gold Coast during the marathon, a few athletes struggled in the extreme weather. And there was talk that maybe the marathon would be moved to later on in the week when temperatures are expected to drop. But the IAAF, the sports governing body, put out a, a press release earlier on today to say that it will go ahead. They've taken advice from their medical team. There's going to be lots of water, lots of medics there, uh, and they hope everything will pass without incidents. But I spoke to uh, Edna Kiplagarian here, who trains in altitude. We'll be reporting on the marathon, of course, a little later here on BBC World News. 
Now, two British pensioners have been jailed for drug smuggling by a court in Portugal. Roger and Sue Clark were caught on board a cruise ship off Lisbon with nine kilos of cocaine sewn into the lining of four suitcases. Our Europe correspondent Damien Grammaticus reports from Lisbon. Lisbon, beautiful in the autumn sun. Last December, a different ship was here. The Marco Polo just arrived from the Caribbean. In cabin 469, Roger and Sue Clark, pensioners who took frequent costly cruises, living beyond their modest income. Police had noticed. Today, the couple, both 72 years old, were brought to court in handcuffs, sentenced to eight years each for yep. drug smuggling. As the judge spoke, Sue dropped her head in tears and Roger, also shaken, turned to her and said, I'll be nearly 80 when I get out. It's ridiculous. As he left the court, He turned to me and said, the truth needs to come out. 200 kilos of cannabis hidden in his car. And recently, frequent trips to Jamaica. The photo they took from their hotel. The wedding they attended. But police caught them with these cases. Empty ones for a friend, they said. The, the luggage. The drugs officer who raided their cabin found more than a million pounds of cocaine in the lining of the bags. At first they acted confident, they said you're not going to find anything, but afterwards they admitted they'd known all along the cases had drugs. Now, instead of enjoying their sunset years, the couple may be spending the rest of them behind bars. Damien Grammaticus, BBC News, Lisbon. Now, for most of us, the mobile phone has become a lifeline that we're often hesitant to put down. But for all of the benefits technology has delivered, there's also a social cost when it comes to interactions with the world around us. Well, photographer Eric Pickersgill set out to show what we would look like with our phones removed. I'm falling asleep back to back with my wife in our, in our bed and we're both using our phones and um, as I'm falling asleep my hand starts to loosen uh, its grip on my phone and my phone slid from my hand and hit the floor right as I fell asleep and I remember that sound waking me up and my hand was still resting next to me uh, as if my phone was still there and that's like the real moment the real aha moment that the removed project was born um, it was like I could see my wife and I from the perspective of my ceiling fan looking down at us and being so close physically, but so emotionally and uh, kind of psychologically separated from one another. I was gonna make, um, whether I was gonna shoot digitally and actually Photoshop the phones out, or uh, if it was gonna end up being more performance-based, which is the route that I ended up taking. So after I photographed um, several family members and close friends, I started to take the camera out into the real world and use it as a way to almost subvert the way that our screens isolate us from the people around us. And so I'd have to find someone in, in public who seemed approachable and introduce myself in the project. We kind of start to stage this and I move around as a photographer and I recompose the situation uh, visually so that it works as a picture. Then I um, come up to them and I remove their phone and I slide it from their hand. And as they're sitting there, you start to see that uh, the world is happening around them, but they keep their stare and they're still doing their part to make the picture. But it seems like their, their wheel is really turning within their brain about what their relationship is to their phone. It's one thing, it's one gesture all at the same time all around the world. I'm certainly not trying to say, get rid of your phones and throw them away. But I really, really hope People. It's true, isn't it? We all do it. I've got mine right here next to me in the studio. That's it from me for now. You can reach me on Twitter. I'm at Samantha TV News. Thanks very much for watching. Bye. For
Hello there. The autumnal weather continues across the northern half of Europe. So with the succession of low pressures, as you can see, one through Friday, the next one brewing up behind, and there are more waiting in the wings. We are just topping up the rainfall that we've already had, the disruptive rainfall this week gone. So it does look like soaking weather will come into the UK once again on Saturday as we've got that other weather, wet and windy weather sweeping its way eastwards through southern Scandinavia and into the low countries. In contrast, yes, there's a few showers around the Black Sea resorts, but it's still summer-like across parts of Turkey, Greece, the Balkans, Italy and across... much of Iberia as well. Southern France again could see coastal flooding and as well as that some very strong winds, gales or severe gale force winds coinciding with those high tides because of the full moon. So yes it looks like the UK, the low countries into Scandinavia set for some very wet and windy weather throughout the weekend. Some of the city forecasts as you can see reflect that weather for London, for Paris. It is drier though as I mentioned further south from Madrid and Rome although the showers do arrive and the heat starts to build actually next week. Some of that rain certainly affecting Berlin and Moscow looks fairly unsettled as well. As ever, there's more on the website. I'm embarking on an epic adventure. From spectacular natural landscapes to the busiest cities in the world. Discovering ancient artefacts to meeting the people who love them and protect them. To understand how thousands of years of culture and tradition continue to shape modern China. Join me, Alistair Souk, for China's Greatest Treasures on BBC World News. Need your fix of the beautiful game? Then head to the BBC Sport website and app for live updates and social media from Premier League and Champions League games. With gossip, goal alerts, quizzes, score predictors, team selectors and top punditry. Go online or download the app now. If you want to take a fresh look at 15th century Renaissance art in Italy, why not travel around in 15th century style? <laughs> Fab. The Harlem Cowboy, I'm coming to town to check it all out. There were powerful patrons such as the Medici and rock star artists such as Michelangelo. Since my childhood in bed Brooklyn, I've enjoyed visiting museums and seeing great art. But nothing compares to being in Florence for the first time. Not only were Renaissance artists making art that defined high aesthetic ideals, but they were also groundbreaking in showing a ethnically diverse, racially mixed Italy in the 15th and 16th century. You just have to look at the art. Hello and welcome to Talking Books with me, Kirsty Watt, here at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. With me today is Jing Jing Lee, whose debut novel, How We Disappeared, explores the world of comfort women. That's Talking Books, here on BBC World News. This is BBC World News, the headlines. U.S. President Donald Trump has hit back against allegations of wrongdoing over his phone call with the Ukrainian president in a series of tweets accusing the Democrats of fabricating a version of the conversation. Nigerian police say they've rescued nearly 500 people from a building in the northern city of Kaduna where they were being detained. Those held were all men and boys and said they had been tortured and sexually abused. A former British cabinet minister has accused the Prime Minister's office of using language about Brexit that incited violence. Amber Rudd has criticised Mr Johnson for having what she called an immoral approach in his choice of language. 
and walking in his mother's footsteps. Britain's Prince Harry has visited a partially cleared minefield in Angola, 22 years after his mother Diana famously did the same. The Duke of Sussex described the visit as quite emotional. Those, uh... Now on BBC World News, our weekly in-depth look at the economic trends that are shaping Africa's future in Business Africa. Hear about efforts to make Ethiopia Africa's leading manufacturing hub. Find out how a smart system is helping solve the problem of parking space in Addis Ababa. And we meet one of the key players in Ethiopia's now flourishing tourism sector. We want to see a lot of Africans visiting the rest of Africa. You really don't have to cross Atlantic or Pacific to go on vacation. Africa has a large and diverse manufacturing sector and manufacturers are now having to keep up with the increasing demands of a growing middle class customer base who are on the lookout for better prices and a greater variety of goods. Ethiopia has achieved economic growth averaging 10.3% between 2006 and 2017. With heavily in the manufacturing sector which experts say is a key element in its success. Ethiopia has set itself an ambitious plan called Vision 2025 to be the leading manufacturing hub in Africa. As part of that plan, it has invested millions of dollars into the development of industrial parks throughout the country. With good incentives and a cheap source of labor, the country is attracting foreign investors into the sector. So I've been finding out more about this manufacturing boom. Ethiopia is a country on the move. It is Africa's fastest growing economy and everywhere you look around the capital Addis Ababa, something new is being built. Beyond the fast changing skyline, the country is also positioning itself as Africa's manufacturing hub. To achieve that, it is investing billions of dollars in developing industrial parks across the country. Manufacturing is a key driver of economic growth here in Ethiopia. Whether it's textiles, paints, or in this case, making shoes, making products for the domestic and international markets is powering this East African economy. And as you can see behind me, the employment benefits are obvious. With a population of over 100 million, Ethiopia has a massive labor pool to draw from. This has attracted a number of multinational companies to invest in the sector. But one local company, Anbesa Shoes, is also capitalizing on this manufacturing boom. So how many shoes do you guys make here a day? In this factory only we make uh, 4,000 to 500,000 5, uh, pairs per day. Four to 5,000 pairs a day? Yeah, the total capacity is, the attainable capacity is 10,000. Wow! Pairs per day. Wow! So you guys are serious, eh? Yeah, yeah, we're serious. <laughs> we're real serious, yeah. <laughs> And Besa makes most of its shoes for the internet. National market, but for the company to thrive, capturing the market share in Africa is a major priority. You know, we our market is uh, USA, uh, France, Belgium, and some African countries as well. But the problem is, uh, is there is no. There is no uh, infrastructure between us, between the African countries. There is no trade relationship which is already established. So uh, it's a new beginning only. I'm sure after some times, uh, African countries will trade with, within themselves. Yeah, so manufacturing is crucial for the Ethiopian economy. Very crucial, very crucial. It is a life and death uh, uh, thing because without, without giving employees for these people, the, 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 every, the future will be very um, dark. So we have to have a lot of manufacturing. We have to have a lot of 
labor intensive manufacturing mm. and get opportunity for the people to work. With an average wage of $26 a month, Ethiopian workers earn the least from the countries in the textile and garment sector. In comparison, workers in Bangladesh and Vietnam earn $95, while the Chinese earn $326. It's true, it's true that the wage rate here is fairly low. Uh, that has been partly the attraction, I mean, the, the source of attraction for the foreign direct investment. But that's not the end of the story, you know, right? So there has to be the productivity side as well. So these workers have to match productivity levels uh, of that of Bangladesh or other countries which we are we are not we have not achieved that productivity levels. And the history of industrial parks show uh, that. Initially, wages are low, and there's, there's some good evidence, empirical evidence, on this one. Initially, uh, wage levels are low, but they tend to increase as productivity levels increase, and as the turnover rate settle. Most of Ethiopia's growth over the past decade has been driven by massive government spending, particularly in infrastructure development. To achieve another decade of growth, the state will have to relinquish some control of the economy to encourage greater private sector investment. Lack of parking space is a big concern in most major cities and here in Addis Ababa they've experienced a massive influx of vehicles in recent years. To solve this problem the city has introduced a smart parking system. So how does it work? We've been finding out. My name is Samara Jalalu. I am the Deputy General Director of Addis Ababa City Transport uh, Traffic Management Agency. In Addis Ababa, we have a traffic congestion, uh, and uh, this is due to not a proper way of uh, parking because a lot of uh, vehicles are parked at uh, roadside, and this this causes uh, traffic congestion. We are looking at Magananya Smart Parking Project, which is uh, one of the three smart parking projects Addis Ababa has. It can accommodate 90 cars at a time. It has three units. This is one of the three units. It has three similar units, each having uh, 15 stories. Vehicles coming from outside will stand at this location. And at this part, their uh, height and uh, weight will be me measured. And if it is appropriate, then the system will take the vehicles up. And after, after they reach on uh, an occupied uh, floor, it will slide them to the side, the side part which, where they will be parked. It has a lot of benefits as I have mentioned. It can accommodate a lot of vehicles using a very constrained space. Anybody who wants to park at the, the smart parking uh, here at Magananya Smart Parking location will be requested to pay around six per per hour, which is uh, equivalent to around 20 to 25 cents. It has been uh, two years since it starts operation. Some of the challenges we face while we manage this, uh, this parking area is about maintenance issue. Uh, so this, this facility needs uh, time to time maintenance. If there is a power cut, we, we do have a backup generator. We will use that one, but when the power cut uh, it comes frequently, it will be uh, somehow a challenge. The city center is the prime location where land is a very scarce resource. Now we start using this kind of smart parking that can uh, accommodate a lot of cars in a very limited uh, land. So the, using this kind of uh, parking technology, we are trying to, to solve the traffic congestion we, we are facing. First time, people were afraid of this technology and they were not sure that they will find their car safely. But now people get accustomed to the system. We devoted to expand parking facilities. So in the new master plan, uh, around 60 locations are allocated for off-street parking, uh, parking facilities. So we, uh, we expect a lot of this kind of uh, new projects will come to our city. As far as we know, this is the first uh
uh, smart parking in Africa, so we are very proud to introduce. This is In Business Africa, coming up on the second half of the program. A top Ethiopian multimedia artist tells us about her unique brand of art. I started a, a, a video work or a performance and I changed this performance into a video and translate this video into a drawing. Across the globe, people have come to rely on an array of products, from bicycles to whiskey, spices to semiconductors. The phone has made my job very easy. This series looks at the people, systems and networks that go into making and bringing them to market. We're spreading the knowledge and the technology across the globe. Made on Earth on BBC World News. This strange looking machine is designed to extract rocks from the seabed. But some experts warn this could prove incredibly damaging to marine life. So what is the future of deep sea mining? I'm David Shukman and for BBC World News, I'll have a special report. Welcome back to In Business Africa. I'm Fumani Mkhize in Addis Ababa. This week, we're taking a look at various sectors delivering growth to the Ethiopian economy. We've heard about the manufacturing boom and also Addis Ababa's smart parking system. Now, let's turn our attention to tourism. Ethiopia's tourism sector grew by 48.6%. This growth has been attributed to the country's improved connectivity as a regional transport hub, international visitor spending and the recent visa relaxation policies. One of the key players in the tourism sector is Tiri Wospelete. His company owns one of the largest resort chains in Ethiopia and neighboring Djibouti and he recently launched Ethiopia's wow. first water park. So I met up with him to find out more about this burgeoning sector. Tere Ospelete, pleasure to meet you sir. Same here, how are you? I'm good, I'm Welcome good. home. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. You. So we are at one of your resorts, Kirif 2 uh, resorts um, here in Ethiopia. It is a very beautiful Thank you setting, so Thank you know. You so Talk to us about how you established this particular venue here. They started with 18 rooms, then we built another 25, mm -hmm. became 25 rooms, yeah. then we uh, became more to 38 rooms, then to 138 now. 138? I'm sorry, 108. Yeah. And are planning to build another 200 now. Wow. Design African uh, built and African operated properties. The reason why is if you know Africans don't have much stake on the continent. Yeah. Most of the properties are not owned by Africans. Mm. So this 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 should be an example and Africa can showcase its own products. Uh, now we have 11 operational businesses. We employ over 3,000 employees currently. We, by the end of the year, we'll open another two properties and maybe we'll reach close to 3,500 employees. But let's look at the tourism sector here in yeah. Ethiopia. I read an interesting statistic that um, Ethiopia is the country that has uh, seen the highest growth of tourism. Uh, last year, close to 50%. You must be yeah. pretty excited about that statistic. I'm very uh, much happy, very, very much happy. You know, I work very hard. Even came to your country a few times, brought a lot of tour operators to yeah. visit Ethiopia yes. to make sure that Ethiopia is seen in a different eye. Yeah. Because Ethiopia doesn't have 
uh, you know, nobody showed the real Ethiopia today. Mm. Everybody is talking about our famine uh, last last many years. It was decades uh, ago. 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Are people still talking about still the famine? Still talking about that. When yeah. you go to Europe to promote Ethiopia, yeah. and they really don't believe, do you really do? Do you have a resort? <laughs> of course you don't have a resort. Yeah. So, so you, you are changing the mindset of what Africa, what I, Ethiopia is I, I seen. Want, I want to put Africa in a different map. The today Africa, the, the people... ...come from all over the world to Africa to visit Africa, not Europe again. Yeah. The culture, the food and everything else. Sure, uh, sure. And Kiriftu uh, Resorts, it's capitalizing on the uh, on that uh, these resources that Ethiopia has, right? Yes. Our our main objective is this: to to really to really to really uh, put Africa together. Inner continent tourism. We go promote all over Africa. We oh. want to see a lot of Africans visiting the rest of the, another Africa. You really don't have to cross Atlantic or Pacific to go, you know, to go on vacation. Yeah, yeah. So we want to keep the foreign currency in the continent. We want to keep the employment in the continent. Yeah. And we want to develop this continent within its own resources. Look at it. Nothing is foreign. 100 percent is local. Yep. Yep. And you have a five-star hotel. Mm. In this property, you have a movie theater that's made locally. Yeah. You sleep on the floor with a mattress mm. and you can watch a movie. Incredible. Your bed is done by a local handicraft person. Mm. Your receptionist was a person who was carrying the stone, now strained it to serve a five-star resort. Mm -hmm. So we use all the resources that Africa offers to make sure that the rest of the people come and visit. Mm -hmm. And as a businessman, are you excited about the potential of Ethiopia and of Africa? Because we've got some of the fastest growing economies in the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. With a billion people. Mm, yes. yes. You know, As you know, Ethiopia has uh, growing uh, for the last 12 to 13 years, 11% uh, mm. uh, growth and we're still maintaining that growth. Mm. And that actually it will double hopefully yeah? mm. because uh, uh, what you see is what you, it's on the ground now mm. but uh, what you see on the pipeline you'll be amazed yeah yeah the dam is coming up and many dam the, the largest dam in Africa yes, yes, yes. and uh, many other things uh, per, uh, resorts are being left and right All over the, con the, mm. the country, yeah. the road construction. The story. Place, another story. Yeah, yeah. Another story. Sure. Look at this property. Mm. The leather goods are the leather goods are developed and built here. Mm. The, the the beautiful dresses that they wear is done here. Mm. You know, Ethiopia has the the biggest leather. Uh, yeah, it has like the biggest leather industry yes. in Africa, right? And look, and look yeah, it that. creates some outstanding garments. Look at it. Yeah. Look at how beautiful our jewelries look. How amazingly designed and built by, by you know, done by Ethiopians. Yeah. And look at look at the the, the, the bags that the bags. we carry. Yeah. yeah. So tell us, who, who are your guests? Are we, is it Ethiopians or are we seeing international visitors as well? My focus is to bring inner continent tourism. I want you to come here. Mm -hmm. I want the rest of Africa to come here and be proud of our own products. Mm. The diaspora of Africa all over the world, that's what we are promoting. Mm. The Ethiopian diaspora, all, including, which is included in the in, in African continent mm. and locals. Mm -hmm. That is the, 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 what I want to promote. And are you they, marketing they, it to absolutely. Africans? I, I travel all over Africa. I was in your country recently, mm -hmm. asking tour, uh, travel agents, tour operators to come and visit my country. And I host many tour operators from all over Africa. Mm -hmm. So they know that they have a good product that is sellable for their brothers and sisters. Sure, sure. So how do you go about tangibly promoting Ethiopia? What me and the, me, uh, me, I am, Ethiopian Airlines and us are a partners mm -hmm. in, the, in this in this venture. Yeah. Ethiopian Airlines flies to all over Africa. Yeah. And we have office is all over Africa and we package it Aha. with the Ethiopian Embassy, yeah. Ethiopian Airlines, all over Africa. Mm -hmm. We try to bring our African brothers and sisters to come and see this country. Yeah, and when they come and see it, this yes. is what's going to be presented to them. This is what's going to Look be. at that. Africa's East Africa's largest water park, you yes. say. You know, uh, I, I am I'm, I'm seeing a lot of family traveling to Dubai, traveling to many other countries to look for a place that they were, where they want to take their families. Yeah. And we really don't have a well-established water park or a theme park in Africa. Yeah. 
So now you decided to build it, absolutely. Build it here absolutely. in Africa. Absolutely. Yeah. What would you like to see for Africa in the next 10, 20 years? I really want all Africans to really think they can do it on their own. You don't need a third party to do it for you. And you can't blame anyone anymore. So we do. Mm -hmm. We change that. Sedos, thank you very much for speaking to us. We really appreciate it. Ethiopia has a vibrant art scene and Helen Zeru is a multimedia artist whose work incorporates video, performance art and drawing. Helen's work depicts the Addis Ababa experience from a deeply personal perspective. So we caught up with her to find out more about her unique brand of art. Recently, I'm working on, like, if I started a, a, a video work or a performance, and I change this performance into a video, and translate this video into a drawing. Um, so I work with different media's. My family received a, a letter that said that we have to remove. Uh, remaining or a grave of a family, which is my mom. After 15 years of her passing, that uh, we had to dig out the um, remaining. So I start to document this uh, process. That's how this project start uh, or conceived. Also, how that affects socially uh, in the social fabric uh, that we live in. So it's 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 a very it starts with a very personal uh, uh, project, but I think I hope that it will touch upon a, a more wider uh, issues in the society. Sometimes I work from a performance a video, from a video I, I want to do a, a drawings like a recipe manual. So this. Drawing is uh, uh, illustrating the sprinkling of the ash and the egg and the uh, lemon here and also like the uh, nostalgia of the childhood, the milk and it, it continues. Like the art scene here is so much isolated from let's, let alone like throughout the rest of Africa, uh, the world but also within East Africa it's quite isolated. Like I had the chance to visit the 32 degrees in Uganda and some spaces in Kenya and I see that there's so much uh, Fluid, that's a fluid uh, movement that's going on. Like artists can move easily from Kampala to I don't, Tanzania, Nairobi, and Kigali. But I think my, the artists here are, uh, or we are, um, very much limited. Now I want to really want to start uh, another art space uh, together with a group of friends, um, like to create a uh, like an alternative space where. So many discussion can happen, uh, experiments and on works. So that's uh, my yeah. I want to do that. That's one thing that I really want to do. Well, that's all the time we've got for this week. From myself, Vumani Mkize, and the team right here in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Thanks for watching, and goodbye. We're doing a trail. <laughs> what is Brexit cast? <laughs> I still don't know. I thought, I thought we, were we were just, just doing, doing a podcast. A podcast. Yeah, yeah, Not fine. anymore. Okay, so, so what about you say, what's Brexit cast? And I say, yeah. well, I'm in Westminster. I say, well, I'm in Brussels. What? We're pretty good at getting the inside of gossip. We'll tell you everything you need to know. I think that would be obvious that from that, obvious? From that yeah. wouldn't it? Well, let's, should we try one and then see let's, how long yeah. it is? Okay, yeah, okay. okay. What is Brexit cast then? Oh, I was looking at the camera, sorry. Oh, sorry. Brexit cast on BBC World News.